Peter Atia, who is the godfather of longevity, has released a new book, which is the Bible of longevity. So it goes over from start to finish how to live a longer life with better health span. And it has a lot of interesting theories on the way we practice medicine and how it could be improved or how it's wrong. Just a quick bit on Peter Atia. So he's a Stanford trained physician. He was an oncology surgeon. And now he has probably the frontier longevity practice in the world. I think my favorite thing about him is that he's really is like skin in the game. He's sees real patients. He does research. He sees how that interfaces. He really sees kind of where the uh, rubber hits the road rather than a lot of these people who t- we've talked about them, charlatans who read a paper, they do the PubMed ID and it sounds great. It showed something in rats or it showed something in monkeys, but it's not going to apply to humans. So he is, I think, the real deal. Um, Adam, do you do you broadly agree with my profiling of him? Because I know you're more plugged into the longevity space. Yeah, I, I think PTSD is great. Um, and I, I agree that a lot of the people in the longevity space are PhDs or people who have uh, who don't really interact directly with patients. And that kind of comes off when you read their writing. So I, I want to discuss two or three of the big ideas from the book. So the first big idea from the book is Peter Atia talks about medicine 3.0. So just for some context, medicine 2.0 is what we currently have. It's this focus on lifespan. There's a little bit of health span in it as well, but it's basically what your doctor currently does. What Peter Atia says is that medicine 3.0 is about leveling up. And instead of thinking about, you know, at the end of the life, how many disability free years you're going to have, how many okay years you're going to have where you're free from a major ailment. Let's think about human thriving, human flourishing in those years. And one of the really interesting frameworks he has, this is something he calls the centenarian Olympics, but he works backwards. So he says, what do you want to be able to do when you're 80, 90 100 and let's work backwards from that so for example if you're a 90 year old you want to be able to pick up your grandkids we know that every decade you're going to lose 10 percent of your strength starting from 30 or 40 so if you want to be able to squat a 20 kilogram grandchild when you're 80 or 90 then today as a 30 year old you should be able to comfortably squat your body weight so i think that's a really interesting approach to medicine as well Another side of medicine 3.0 is leaning into Mm. risk. So he says in medicine 2.0, we've been too risk averse. We see uh, the numbers, we see the clinical data, fair enough, that's medicine. But he thinks that we've been as doctors too risk averse. And sometimes we sacrifice human flourishing, human thriving, these kinds of bits for the sake of being too risk averse. One of the examples in his view is HRT in older women and the impact that can have. The last thing that he talks about is just shifting our time horizons in medicine 3.0. Currently, we look at 10-year risk profile. So if someone comes in, we look at what's your 10-year risk of having a heart attack or stroke. By that point, most of the damage has already been done. And okay, there's some things you can do, but wouldn't it be better if you started earlier? So he says, we should be thinking about your 40-year risk, your 50-year risk, because Instead of thinking that, you know, diabetes, pre-diabetes starts at this level, then type 2 diabetes starts at this lab value, let's think, actually, this is all beginning in your 20s or 30s. This is a broader metabolic symptom and this poor health, this stuff that's clogging up your arteries, it's all starting really early on. So let's treat it like that. Um, So yeah, that's medicine 3.0. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I like the concept of looking at 20-year risk, 30-year risk, but I would even go further and say that where everyone is at that risk, like no no single person is not at risk of heart disease. Um, yeah. We're just genetically programmed to develop heart disease, metabolic dysfunction at some point. So I would even not even think about if think about it in that way. I'd just say everyone is at risk. We once you you uh, you develop signs of that risk getting worse, then you need to to intervene super early. One. Uh, a clear quote example of that is um, LDL cholesterol levels, which uh, when we look at longitudinal studies, we can see that a slight increase in, in LDL cholesterol over a long period of time, so duration of exposure is a really important factor here, uh, increases your risk d- independent of the level of, of, uh, uh, of LDL cholesterol. So for example, two people uh, aged 40, um, one person at age uh, 39 had the normal cholesterol level and then one year later they have a, a, a high cholesterol level and then the other person who was 40 has the same level but it started at age 30 started going up so the the second person the person who has a longer exposure has a much higher risk because of the area under the curve which is what is important here 
uh, it's the area under the curve of the uh, increase in LDL cholesterol. Um, and if you think of, of uh, blood pressure, blood glucose levels, uh, all of these markers that we know of general health, if we think of it the same way, in the same way, um, we should be thinking of that like duration of exposure instead of the snapshot of the the single level. Do you, do you think as well that we're too um, risk averse in the sense that we prioritize things that show up on numbers that show up as like clinical bad outcomes against prioritizing things that will actually help people live happier healthier lives i mean a prime example that comes to my mind is sometimes when patients come into primary care they'll be like 80 90 and they want a medicine say it's like a sleeping tablet say it's like a painkiller and you you feel a bit funny about that because you're like oh, I don't know, you know, you could take this, you could have a fall at home, it could make you drowsy and something could happen. But if you did give it to them, I think it would make their life a lot better. So it's a, there's always a bit of a tension. And I think Vatia gives a point that we are maybe too risk averse currently. The way I think about it and the way I would frame it is that we're, uh, we talk about personalized medicine, but we don't actually practice personalized medicine. And to me, personalized medicine is running N equal one experiments with single people and having them informed about the risks. So uh, the way I would do it is uh, if one single person wants to run an experiment that has risks and they understand those risks, your role as a physician is to help them do that and and minimize uh, harm, but also help them measure the effect of that experiment. So a good example would be, for example, blood pressure. We know that ideal blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is probably around 110, uh, even lower in some cases. But uh, most physicians would be comfortable keeping people at around 130 or less um, systolic blood pressure. Why? Because uh, any intervention might uh, increase the risk of, as you said, hypertension or um, side effects. But if the patient knows about that, we can do small experiments and measure uh, the the side effects and then adjust accordingly. Uh, And I think that's real personalized medicine. Um, that we should be advocating. It, it, the problem is that it takes that that that's resource intensive, and most physicians don't have the time to run these kind of um, n equal one experiments. One one thought that does often cross my mind is the added burden of anxiety about health status, with our improved understanding of um, preventative measures and the type of thinking that Adam described, which is actually thinking about your cardiovascular risk a few decades earlier than you might otherwise. Um, you know, what is like, what was the price we pay for that? So um, I like to think about those things. Um, I talk about them with my wife, who's an NHS GP, a primary care physician. And her instinct is like, you know, um, do the things that you know that will benefit you, like with your diet, with your exercise, with your sleep, and try not to worry too much about your health status because some of those things, although they are modifiable or measurable, uh, the likelihood is that in most cases, um, if you were to measure them, you know, they wouldn't be in a range that you would have to treat them for now. And it's just adding to your like, you know, concern, your anxiety about your health status and your, and your health behaviors. So that's the kind of conversation we have in the household. She's still a practicing physician, maybe very much steeped in the, um, in the, in the thinking of the cost constrained and resource constrained NHS. But um, I do think that that's one thing we'll have to deal with at large if we start to bring yeah. earlier prognostication and diagnosis into the population. So... I have two comments on that. First, so I think the the correct way of doing it is to encourage people to outsource that worry and that anxiety to yep. their primary care physician. And I think uh, that's where innovation and, and uh, kind of health tech tools come into play. So that's something that we did, for example, at SPAN is um, our, the idea with my previous startup was that we would aggregate all the health data from all your wearables and you don't even have to worry about it. You don't have to track it yourself. We just give you the pure insights and suggestions and we measure the impact. I think that's what a really good primary uh, care service Mm -hmm. should do. You should go in, do your tests, and then you receive a plan, take this pill, do this, and we'll worry about like, and uh, and you can kind of... uh, select the level of insight or like uh, anxiety that you want to be uh, that you want to get because if you're like a, a super anxious person you don't want to know just let me know like what to take and, and what to do and I'll do it mm-hmm. I don't want to know about my numbers then that's fine uh, but if you want to know all the numbers and all the curves and all of that we can also provide you with that so I think there's a lot of individualization there but it's also I like this concept of outsourcing the anxiety to someone to data freaks like us 
Because <laughs> I, I want to know more. I, I like I'm not content with uh, just knowing what we can know. I want to know everything, and I want to know like the even if there's a tiny risk, uh, I kind of uh, thrive on that. I want to know more. It doesn't affect I agree. me negatively. But I've dealt with people who uh, suffer from what's called health anxiety, and it's a real thing. Uh, you can have real anxiety caused by um, your. Uh, so I mean, this is a bit of a. Um, like a hidden secret of longevity and private uh, practice is that um, a lot of it is, I wouldn't say exploiting, but kind of playing into uh, people who have health anxiety and there's a bit less emphasis on maybe you don't want to need, uh, you don't need to know this information. You don't need to do it an MRI, a whole body MRI scan every year. Um, uh, but if people are paying for it, they're going to find someone who will lean into that and do it yeah so i mean i think there's a lot of individualization i need to kind of uh, assess the patient's need and like how uh you know if, the, if it's going to be like an, a net negative knowing all of this stuff so the second big idea from Matthias' book is the way we think of evidence is wrong and i think over the past few years we've seen this science with a capital s aka the religion of science when people say science says this or science says that and you always know if someone says that it's not true because that's not um how it works but the point he makes is that when we're thinking about longevity and i'm not talking about the quacky stuff about living to 500 in a computer interface i'm talking about really you know realistic goals like living to 100 in good health and having like a nice dignified quick death uh, which is, I think, what most people actually want. Um, he talks about that in this like religion of science, we've been using the gold standard randomized controlled trial, which is really basically you want to know if a drug or something works. You take a group of people, you split them into half randomly and give one side the drug and the other side basically nothing, and you see the impact. And that has been our gold standard in the medical complex. Now, obviously, in longevity, this doesn't work. So how can you redesign a randomized control trial, which looks at, hey, we gave this drug to 20-year-olds and that prevented them having a bad outcome when they're 90. Like 70-year-long randomized control trials of good quality don't really exist. So essentially, he just says, okay, you know, let's just take a step back. Longevity has a bad name because of people who quote like mice trials, but we do need to look at other forms of evidence. We need to look at observational studies. We need to look at also not just mice studies and rodent studies, but if there's something consistently showing effect in both rodents, in non-human primates, in all of these things, and it's consistently showing that effect, let's just pay attention to it. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that in terms of just shifting our view of evidence and capital S science. My view is that here... Uh this is another use case of n equal one experiments where if you can show demonstrate improvement in a certain marker um even if you're using something that is more experimental or not proven in randomized controlled trials if you're using it in one person in a methodological way and you're showing an improvement in health marker then that justifies the use of this uh, of this intervention um but i think this is a broader problem of uh, maybe imran you want to comment on this of kind of pharma pharmacological research in general uh, uh, so one example here, one pioneer in this is, is like the, the TAME trial uh, that is proposing to, to measure the effects of metformin on aging. Uh, so I think there, there needs to be more funding and more uh, research that looks at age-related um, disease onset as a primary uh, endpoint. And the problem is there's just not enough uh, interest and not enough uh, funding to, to, to fund these big, Wait, big Adam, trials. Let me, I mean, Adam, so what you're saying is with the TAME trial that's looking at using metformin, a common diabetes drug, and seeing its effects on aging, can we slow aging down, basically? I think what the interesting thing near Barzillai has done is, like, I gave the example of, you know, running a randomized controlled trial where you give it to people in their 40s and 50s and you track them until they're 90. That's a 40-year study, unrealistic, too expensive. What he's done is he set like a surrogate marker. So he said, let's look at when these people first developed their first major illness. And that is something that will happen in the next five or 10 years, probably in this group. So he's, there, there are interesting ways in which you can set surrogate markers. Yeah, that, that's actually the main things. innovation of the TAME study. I, I, I think uh, metformin, I don't think is that, is that big of a longevity drug. And I don't think the TAME study will show huge impact. But uh, the main innovation is that they got the NIH to approve that surrogate endpoint. Um, and that was really important. And I think we need bigger and larger studies uh, to, to look at that endpoint with different interventions. And that needs to be 
I mean, we, we, even if we had a fraction of the funding we have for cancer drugs, looking at cancer endpoints, going into mm-hmm. that endpoint, we'll have a revolution in longevity treatments. So, so, so I don't, um, um, Adam, you, you posed the question to me a moment ago. Like, I don't have the answer, but I can see that there are lots of different approaches. So I do think that, um, you know, this N of one approach is a really, is a really um, relevant one, which actually I think would be quite resource intensive. And I think that's the problem in many healthcare systems is you can't actually deliver healthcare like that. In addition to that, you have people working on digital twin technology where they're trying to basically get to a point where we can model physiology in silico so you can begin to understand across multiple different parameters you know before you've even dosed someone what the impact of a certain drug would be because you know you've gathered enough data on their physiology or on lots of people's physiology um so you have these type of in silico uh, potential uh, research methods which are emerging and then you also in the kind of biological domain you have people looking at you know i've often joked it's a great time to be a mouse uh, because of all these studies that are showing like longevity in mice but you have like other approaches where people are using like human cells in organoids, uh, which are much more sophisticated than single cell cultures, where you basically create like a miniature version of like cardiac tissue or bone marrow or vascular tissue. And you may actually create like a miniature organ, which has multiple different structures inside it. And that that's, becomes your that's system. That's great for drug discovery. That's yeah. great for drug discovery. But the problem is that we're we're going into phase phase three trials that are looking at endpoints that are not. Uh, that I think are the wrong endpoints in many cases. We should be looking at the tame endpoints more often. Okay, what would be some examples? The, g- g- give us some examples of endpoints. Like, are you talking about like um, um, vascular elasticity and things like that? No, so the, the endpoint of tame was uh, onset of any one of the uh, major age-related diseases. Uh, okay. And, uh, so that, that, was, that was the endpoint that they proposed in tame. Uh, whereas most trials are looking at, you know, very specific diseases or very specific endpoints related to uh, a single disease. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I think there needs to be a shift uh, because, as you said, in, in, and I agree with Peter Tia, is that um, we won't have randomized controlled trials looking at uh, a lot of these longevity markers because it's just not practical. But I think there is a way around it if we shift, uh, you know, proportion of research uh, into tame end, endpoints. Okay, so Imran, let me get your public health lens on this question. So this isn't Peter Atia's point, but this is something I've come across when we're talking about proactive screening, proactive treatment, getting into stuff really early when maybe there's not a real problem to be treated yet. And the framing is that sometimes in medicine, we think on a population-based level, we are looking at studies which have been done on a cross-section of the population and they're meant to be applied to millions of people. And Adam's been mentioning this point of shifting our lens to more of the individual frame, the N equals one, what can we personally do for this person? And I think the really interesting concept I've come across in longevity is about this long tail of medicine. So let me give you an example, which is that we will joke about people having whole body MRI scans every year, which is clearly, uh, well, a bit ridiculous. And on a population level, that doesn't make sense. You're going to pick up thousands of incidentalomas, incidental findings, and it's not going to be hugely beneficial. But on the individual level and thinking about the long tail of medicine, so thinking about those really unlikely outcomes, it is possible that you will pick up a cancer really early and they will get some treatment for it. So my point, I guess, is is that do we sometimes miss or think too much about the forest rather than the trees? And are we missing this long tail of medicine where if we looked at someone as an individual as a in a personalized approach, that we would be a bit more proactive and on these kinds yeah. of things? So I think the I think the issue the reason why you have this clash of paradigms is that public health like the clue is in the name right so um, these are people whose so, whose task is principally to like make resource allocation decisions and policy decisions at population level so that's why you get these competing um, interests where like you know where does your next incremental dollar go does it go in like maternal mortality or does it go on MRI screening or does it go on statins in the water supply so that paradigm I think will always be concerned with that population level intervention where they're having to think about the impacts of on the forest and um when you have you know at the other end of the of the extreme where you have people who have the luxury of being able to deal with n equals one uh type of encounters i think that's just it's just a very different um it's a very different world and the decision making and the benefactor and the amount of resource that's available and the kind of 
um, spe specialization of the treatment to the individual is just a totally different uh, proposition. So I think that's why you see this um, this conflict. And I don't think, I think a lot of like people, when they hear uh, people on the internet talk about, oh, I had this whole body MRI and I found this thing on my kidney and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, everybody should have access to this. Is that they're committing that kind of logical fallacy there where they're looking at what's possible for them as an individual in their circumstances. And they're kind of equating that with what should be done at a policy level, you know, for a whole population of trees. So I, I think- There's it, also I think a that, health that, economics uh like argument yeah. here to say that you know that money that you're going to spend on a whole body MRI, you're you're probably more likely to find something more significant if you just do like a full blood panel every year. Yeah, but but the, but the reason that the health economic argument is even like made is because that resource is resource that everybody in the population would have a claim for when it comes to public budgets. But when it comes to the individual, I mean, this is like discretionary spending, whether you spend your incremental dollar on a Kit Kat, a pack of cigarettes or an MRI, like it's kind of up to you. <laughs> All equally useful. <laughs> like uh, another uh, like another good example here is colonoscopies. So bowel cancer or colon cancer is Are you an advocate of colonoscopies, Adam? I am. <laughs> right. Uh, but the problem is, uh, so bowel cancer or colon cancer is completely preventable because w they start at small uh, as small polyps, and then you can remove those um, if you did, if detected early. That's why colonoscopies are recommended at certain ages. But uh, a more uh, health, economic, uh, uh, efficient way of doing it is doing um, stool analysis. Uh, so yeah. right now, I think in the UK, at ages above uh, is it sixty five, you're or maybe four to five, you're you're entitled to colonoscopy every ten years, but then you can do a fecal occult blood test every every year. So yeah. you're probably missing a few people there uh, yeah. with this approach. But on a population level, it makes sense because you need to take the economics into consideration. But if someone has uh, unlimited resources and uh, low health anxiety, I would recommend they they do uh, just get a colonoscopy every year. Adam, what is your preferred minimum number of annual colonoscopies? <laughs> <laughs> I think. I mean, speaking to expert expert gastroenterologists, they all say that every year is a bit overkill. So maybe every few years you, you get a colonoscopy. The last point on Peter Atiyah's book is about emotional health and longevity. And I think this is an area overlooked by a lot of the bros who are into longevity, uh, rightly or wrongly so. But it's quite cool. So Peter Atiyah's therapist is Esther Perel, who's also like the godfather of therapy and relationship counseling and stuff so it's quite cool how these two big players in the space kind of counsel each other as well which is the godmother. quite interesting the godmother sorry yeah um and she asked peter atia what's the point of living for so long if you're utterly miserable just some quick context peter atia is incredibly successful incredible workaholic but he was at a point where he was just totally detached and totally miserable. He talks about a scenario in which he's in New York working and he gets a call from his wife to say that their, I think, five-year-old kid has had a cardiac arrest. And he says, okay, ring me when you're in ITU and I'll speak to the doctors and carries on working in, in New York. So he was totally, he was in the stage of life where he was just totally kind of devoted to his work, but perhaps lacking on the emotional side of things. And then he ended up going into kind of a mental health retreat and working on that side of things. But I think my broad question to both of you is in terms of longevity, and Adam, I don't know if you do this in your longevity practice, is there any appreciation? And I want to separate actually, so there's mental health, but let's talk about emotional health. Is there any work towards that in your longevity practice or is there any things that you recommend doing? Yeah, I think it's a huge aspect. And I always say there's like five aspects, or like there's five um, kind of cornerstones of, of longevity. There's, uh, when it comes to lifestyle, uh, there's um, sleep, exercise, nutrition, avoidance of harm, and then there's the emotional health. Um, and they're very much interconnected. My focus is more on the first four because they play into emotional health and it's not my area of expertise, but we do work with people who are expert, uh, experts um, on emotional health and mental health well-being. And I think it's uh, it's definitely really important. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of research uh, on your point um, about emotional health and longevity that shows that the most successful citizens in their longevity, one of the kind of cardinal characteristics is the quality and number of their relationships, their intimate relationships. There's a very good study uh, that we can link below, and there's a short news article about this from Harvard, uh, which basically found, um, you know, is really it's a really good predictor of survival, of longevity, and of health span. 
is the quality and quantity of your relationships. And I do think that so one wait, of the, the, the is the quantity. So is there a positive correlation between quantity of relationships and longevity? Or is it the no, like, it le, so the other way? Let me actually pull the study up. So the study is called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It's basically a very long term. I think it's like a cohort study, um, which started in 1938. So it's one of those, you know, ones that I don't know if we'll be kicking off studies like this very often anymore. But basically followed um, 724 participants. 270 of them were from Harvard University and 450 or so from Boston at large. And then they now follow up the descendants of these people. And they basically found... Um, that one of the key conclusions is that good relationships uh, are key to physical and mental well-being. So it is interesting because I do think that you can get sucked into some of the aspects of like health and well-being culture, which, you know, whether it's like gym culture, which has a, has a kind of dark side in terms of like body image and body consciousness, um, or, um, you know, optimizing to the nth degree for technology. And you can have this as a blind spot, I think, as you pointed out, Adam, and I also think, you know, just recent changes in terms of COVID, remote work, and just the atomization of society and families and so on makes it harder for people to feel embedded in like a fabric of relationships. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's also a, it's it's more, you're more likely to be kind of active. You're more likely to be healthy if you're doing this with the other people who have the same lifestyle. So you can't really kind of look at one aspect of the, of, of health with, without the other. So they, they say here in the study that... Um, they started to look back uh, at their people who were happy and healthy at the age of 80, and they wanted to see what was it that would predict their happiness and well-being at that age. And they thought it would be cholesterol level or blood pressure at the age of 50 that would be the best predictor, and it wasn't. It was satisfaction in your relationships, particularly in your marriage, that was the best predictor of a happy and healthy life.